Welcome everyone to the Rockwell Distinguished Lectures in the Department of Religion at Rice University. I'm Professor Marsha Brennan and I'll be hosting today's event. The theme of this year's Rockwell Lectures is Religion and Black Lives Matter. Today's talk is the third lecture in our series thus far. We have an exciting program of speakers lined up for the fall and for further information on upcoming talks, I encourage you to visit our departmental website. Today, one of our doctoral students, Bradley Johnson, will be assisting me with the technical aspects of the program, including the question and answer session. Thank you, Bradley, for your help. Um, I'd also like to thank our wonderful departmental staff, Marcy Newton and Diana Hurd, and our chair, Professor Elias Bongba in the Department of Religion here at Rice. Because this is a webinar that's being hosted on Zoom, um, as audience members, when the time comes, you should type in questions for our speaker in the question and answer function that's found at the bottom of your screen. After the talk, Bradley will be reading the questions aloud and directing them to our guest, who I will now introduce. Okay, today we are so fortunate to have with us Professor Kirsten Pye Buick, Professor of Art History and Associate Dean of Equity and Excellence at the University of New Mexico at Albuquerque. Professor Buick has published extensively on African American art, and she's been the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including the Smithsonian American Art Museum's Predoctoral Fellowship and the Charles Gaius Bolin Fellowship at Williams College. In 2015, she was chosen as the 11th recipient of the David C. Driscoll Prize for Excellence in African American Art. Since 2000, she has taught at the University of New Mexico, where she specializes in art of the US, African American art, the visual culture of the first British Empire, issues of gender and race as they impact the historiography of art, representations of the American landscape, and representations of the of enslavement and the history of women as patrons and collectors of art. Her book, Child of the Fire, Mary Edmonia Lewis and the Problem of Art History's Black and Indian Subjects is published by Duke University Press. Her second book, In Authenticity, Kara Walker and the Eidetics of Racism is in progress. I have long, long known and admired and taught Professor Buick's wonderful book on Edmonia Lewis. In this groundbreaking volume, Professor Buick engages the vehicle of the monograph to break open the familiar paradigm of the art historical monograph, as she presents the sculptor's life and work as a study in complexities and composites, as a dynamic array of subjective, cultural, and aesthetic intersections. Today, Professor Buick's talk promises to offer an incisive historical and cultural perspective on related issues in American social life and visual culture. Her lecture is entitled, At Ease, Representation and the Limits of Social Justice. In this talk, she'll examine the ways in which empathy functions as a complicated social emotion that inflects social justice from abolition to the civil rights movement. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kirsten Buick. Good afternoon, everyone. I am so honored to be here and I'm so honored to participate in an amazing program of scholars and speakers on this subject. I'd like to begin by thanking Professor Marcia Brennan, whom I've long admired. Um, the Carolyn and Fred McManus Professor of Humanities, Professor of Art History and Religious Studies. I would like to thank Diana Hurd, Bradley Johnson, Maggie Shaw, and Marcy Newton. I'd also like to thank and acknowledge the students at Rice University. And because of the circumstances that allow them to attend in real time, my current and former students at the University of New Mexico. And I'd also like to offer a special thanks for the vision and implementation of a series on Black Lives Matter by uh, Elias Bongba, Harry and Hazel Chavane Chair in Christian Theology, Professor of Religion 
Department Chair of Religion. I dedicate today's lecture to the memory of my beloved mother, Jerry Buick. Since the Enlightenment, empathy rests most narrowly Since the Enlightenment, empathy has been both an effective and affective tool in the struggle for and against human rights. Empathy rests most narrowly on the fantasy that I can feel what you feel, and on the precondition that in order to act on your behalf, your embodied experiences must be accessible to my own. When conceptualized as a social emotion, one group acting on behalf of or against the interests of another group, empathy has proven to be historically at fault for the limitations of social justice movements. This lecture will explore the crucial role that representation plays in these fantasies of appropriated embodiment and progress. From the Wedgwood Medallion of 1787, currently on your screen, to the current debates around Confederate monuments and public space, how do we approach empathy as a social emotion? How do we get at ease? Ease, of course, empathy is social emotion. Perhaps it is time, following Professor Paul Bloom, that we make the case for rational compassion and the re-envisioning of public space and thus social relations. On August 17th, 2020, a Virginia state senator was charged with injuring Confederate monuments. Uh, senator Louise Lucas faces charges after a statue was torn down during a protest. And this is a story written three days later by Victoria Moorwood. A Virginia state senator faces charges after tearing down a Confederate monument during a protest in Portsmouth, authorities said on Monday, August 17th. Senator Louise Lucas has been charged with conspiracy to commit a felony and injury to a monument in excess of $1,000. The Confederate statue was reportedly torn down during a protest in June and led to one demonstrator being critically injured. Senator Lucas turned herself into the Portsmouth Sheriff's Office on Tuesday. She was released on a personal recognizance bond that afternoon and did not have to post bail. The state senator is one of 14 people facing charges as a result of the monument's dismantling, including three public defenders, a Portsmouth school board member, and local NAACP chapter members. As art historian Kurt Savage reminds us, public monuments were meant to yield resolution and consensus, not to prolong conflict. The impulse behind the public monument was an impulse to mold history into its rightful pattern. And history was supposed to be a chronicle of heroic accomplishments, not a series of messy disputes with unresolved outcomes. Even now, to commemorate is to seek historical closure to draw together the various strands of meaning in a historical event or personage and condense its significance for the present in a speech or a monument. And my question for you, the extension of empathy towards objects and property, how did we arrive here? One of the most influential books in my academic life has been Linda Bolton's Facing the Other, Ethical Disruption in the American Mind, published in 2004. In the book, she provides a really wonderful introduction to the philosophies of Emmanuel Levinas. And she examines the theoretical ideal of sympathy in its relation to ethical agency.
And while sympathy can become the basis for ethical action, it remains a self-reflexive experience. It relies upon an activity of egological translation in which the encounter with the other's suffering is assimilated into the imaginative experience of the self. And the necessity for assimilation both restricts and undermines its ethical potential. As James Engel in The Creative Imagination, published in 1981, points out, the danger of interpretation of translation is at work. However much we sympathize with another, we can never be sure that our imagination is accurately reproducing what he feels. We may misconstrue his experience. This may then not be sympathy, but a form of empathy projecting how we imagine a person feels, and then identifying with that false projection. In terms of Levinasian ethics, sympathy fails in such moments, for in its recovery of the other's experience, it becomes a kind of emotional appropriation, and as such, a mode of relationship constituted through comprehension. Sympathy returns the other to the experiential province of the self same. And let me pause here and say that my talk this afternoon unfolds in four parts. And given the range of examples that spectacles of empathy provide, this was no small feat. Part one begins in the 18th century and provides us with somewhat of an answer to the previous question, how did we arrive here? based on what I have learned over the decades about human rights movements, about race in quotation marks, about the enlightenment and its culture of sentiment, about property, citizenship, and belonging, and how gender functions within, between, and among those phenomena. Finally, my talk is not the scripted offering of a guest lecture. Instead, it is what I would do if I were invited to teach. All sources and movement towards answers or conclusions are there on the slide because Zoom is disorienting enough. Part one, the transformation of human property into adversaries of property. And I'd like to stop and make a note about language in my very deliberate use of language. I use deliberately human rather than dehumanized or dehumanization. We must never lose sight of the human within these relationships, within these phenomena. Um, I find dehumanization as a concept, part of academic language. And I'll say a, something about that in a second. Contraband laws punished enslaved people for stealing themselves. Running away was a form of property theft. And you may ask, how is that not dehumanization? Well, it's not. Because the breeding programs, the rapes that produce children, all of these things reaffirm the human. I also use the term Africans, not slaves. I used enslaved people rather than slaves. I use the word Africans or black people or African Americans and not black bodies. Because what all of this leads to is academic language that is both cutting edge and comforting and lazy. As I said, we must never let go of the human. And by indulging ourselves in concepts of dehumanized or dehumanization, what we usually end up doing unintentionally is othering both the perpetrators of these horrific events and the victims of those events. While we 
carve out for ourselves as compassionate, empathetic human beings, a space that says, no, we could never participate in that. No, we could never commit that act or be part of that act when what human nature teaches us is that we very well could. And so part one, the transformation of human property into adversaries of property. In 1789, this uh, engraving became one of the most effective forms of representation within the abolitionist movement. The Wedgwood medallion of the kneeling figure, about which I'll say more, of course, but also the cross section of the slave ship. They became highly effective in the first, one of the first global human rights movements uh, in the world. But it was effective within limits in that it transforms the bodies of enslaved Africans, or it, it transforms the bodies of Africans uh, into hatch marks, into abstractions. And so the, the crosscut of the slave ship wasn't quite enough. And in 1787, William Wilberforce commissioned a model of a slave ship to be passed from hand to hand during the debates around abolition in the House of Commons. So to touch the ship, to feel it, to have it sensorily connect uh, to the self, this is a form of empathetic engagement that actually speaks to the limits of the cross section of the slave ship. Uh, and as the slide says, uh, Wilberforce model of the slave ship, wood and pasted copper engraving, 1787, to be passed from hand to hand during the debate in the House of Commons. The Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade was founded in 1787. In 1807, Great Britain passes the bill to abolish the English slave trade. What is perhaps most telling in this model is the nod to decorum. As the ship, it appears to be divided uh, into rooms. And these rooms are demarcated in English, the men's room and the women's room. And so even as the model ship was supposed to communicate something visceral, there is still, there was still something that said, I cannot offend the sensibilities of my fellow members of parliament. And so limitations, right? the limits of social justice are there at the beginning of social justice movements. In 1846, we had one of perhaps the only views of the interior of a slave ship uh, it was made by Lieutenant Francis Maynell. By 1846, the British had become the policemen of the seas, and they would seize Spanish slave ships like the Albanals. Uh, that was uh, seized in 1846. And as I said, this is one of uh, the only ones known to be in existence. And at this point, I'd like to make a note on image scarcity. Images like Maynell's, uh, images like the Agassiz daguerreotypes that are currently in the Peabody Museum at Harvard University, when the Swiss uh, anthropologist Louis Agassiz had daguerreotypes made of a group of eight uh, enslaved individuals, images like the scourged back that shows the brutally beaten back, the whip marks uh, and the keloid scars of an enslaved man named Gordon. Uh, enslaved people laboring in the fields. The question becomes why didn't abolitionists use photography 
to show the tortured bodies of enslaved people. And I, I have my own uh, suspicions, but I, I think that perhaps one of the reasons is because had they done so, they couldn't go home again. They couldn't go home to whiteness again. And so photography was underutilized in terms of showing the tortured bodies, the, the uh, mutilations practiced on African people. It was a bridge too far. And in order to absorb the, the, the people whom they were indicting, the people who profited in the slave uh, trade, in order to reabsorb them into, you know, back into um, some kind of peace, what the, the kind of markings on the bodies of Africans had to be sacrificed. The abuse, the, the torture suffered by Africans, the, the witnessing of that had to be sacrificed. When the Wedgwood medallion made by uh, the Englishman Josiah Wedgwood made its way across the Atlantic, the male figure was transformed into a female figure, replacing the legend, am I not a man and a brother, with the legend, am I not a woman and a sister. As it crosses the Atlantic, it does so with the acknowledgement that in the United States, white women temporarily abandoned their work on behalf of First Nations people in favor of abolition and through the rhetoric of enslavement on behalf of themselves. Transforming the kneeling figure from male to female made the emblem more empathetic for white women but neither feminism nor abolitionism were ever free of racism. For example, the New York Women's Anti-Slavery Society refused to accept black women in their ranks, arguing that while slavery was a moral evil, they had no desire to have black women as their social equals. And so often, empathy is not the look across, it is the look down. And so even as the black male figure in the Wedgwood medallion seems to entreat a liberator, an emancipator who is white and male, in this iteration of the medallion as it crossed the Atlantic with the legend, am I not a woman and a sister? and a Bible verse underneath, the emancipator, the liberator, is a white woman whose circumstances were not much better oftentimes than enslaved African women uh, in that they could be abused, they could be institutionalized, they could be killed. Um, Indeed, borrowing the rhetoric of enslavement was one of the most effective tools in their own liberation, in the liberation of white women. And so I, I wanted to share with you another book in addition to Linda Bolton's that has been very influential in my thinking around empathy and sympathy and the culture of sentiment. And that's Lori Marish's Sentimental Materialism, Gender, Commodity Culture, and 19th Century American Literature. And this is her section on sentimental sympathy and sentimental ownership, which I'll come back to throughout the PowerPoint. She writes, sentimental narratives engender feelings of power as well as submission, endemic to liberal political culture. They thus instantiate a particular form of liberal political subjection in which agency and subordination are intertwined, specifically as codified within 18th century sentimental historical narratives and 19th century domestic fictions, sentimental sympathy prescribed forms of paternalism 
specifically of benevolent caretaking and willing dependency suited to a liberal capitalist society uh, or a social order that privileged individual autonomy and especially private property ownership. Critics of sentimental literature have often pointed out that sympathy conventionally operates across a status divide. Typical objects of sympathy in these narratives are children, slaves, the poor, the disabled, and in sentimental narratives, it is the sympathy of the empowered for the disempowered, the strong for the weak, the fully human for the dehumanized, that is enlisted as socially and ethically salient. The weak, she states parenthetically in sentimental texts, have ethical primacy through their intimate knowledge of suffering, a sign of Christ-like authenticity but they have nothing politically useful to learn from the strong. Becoming civilized in these texts entails a willing renunciation of power over others, cast in bodily terms, and marks the sublimation of aggression into sympathetic desire. Pin cushions like the one on the screen allowed for fantasies of appropriation and substitution and empathetic exchange. As women who used it were instructed to imagine that every pick prick of the pin was a lash against their own backs. In such ways, the violence of enslavement entered the domestic spaces of those who did not own enslaved people. And there were coins like the, the ones on the screen. This one dated 1838. And just as the enslaved's body was traded for money, this coin was supposed to both represent and indict that trade as it was traded at abolitionist fairs. And then there's Hiram Powers' Greek slave, made in the context of uh, an increasing abolitionist challenge to a slave-owning country. The pro proliferation of chained, dead, and dying and suicidal white women in art and literature and performances, etc., served as a corollary to the invalidism and opium addiction that swept their middle and upper class ranks. They also served such statues, for example, as warnings of the precarity of their status as ladies as they began to act on behalf of enslaved women and on behalf of themselves for what they termed the civil death of marriage and the slavery of sex. Often I challenge my students to imagine what a free woman looks like and they can never imagine it. They cannot uh, provide an example. And we'll return to this in part three. On the left is the Wedgwood Medallion. On the right is a photograph of Eli Harold, Colin Kaepernick, and Eric Reed, who are kneeling before a game against the Arizona Cardinals, October 7th, 2016. And about Kaepernick's gesture, what comes to be known as uh, Kaepernick's passion, if you will, um, Nick Mirzoff notes, in his article, The Historical Failure and Revolutionary Potential of Taking a Knee, he, he asks, why is taking a knee become such a focal point of what seems like the permanent crisis of the Trump administration? Every now and again, an image forces its way out of the endless stream of vernacular, commercial, and artistic pictures and freezes our attention. When Colin Kaepernick and his allies take a knee, they adopt a pose from the lexicon of 18th and 19th century abolitionism, whether consciously or not. For both performer and viewer, the form invokes and awakens cultural memory and becomes noticed. Its disruptive effect comes from being a repetition with a difference. Taking a knee cuts the white emancipator from the frame and thereby creates something new, 
an abolition image. When performed today by live African-American bodies without the white hero, taking a knee reveals the hollowness of the Emancipation Memorial's performative gesture. In adopting the abolitionist pose without the abolitionist, taking a knee makes visible its failures by means of what Christina Sharp, an African-American scholar who writes on Black visual studies, has called Black redaction. By cutting out the presumed white liberator, the familiar but now different pose makes Black life visible, if only momentarily, as Sharp puts it. White abolitionism gives way to a glimpse of Black abolition democracy, the possibility of Black life. The journey from abolitionist to abolition may only be three redacted characters, but it makes a different world. Kaepernick and his fellows ask not uh, an individual, but white supremacy as a whole. Am I not a man and a, a, man and a brother? Settler, settler colonialism replies, as it always has done from the indigenous expulsions to the ending of DACA, go away. But there is nowhere for these Americans to go. The United States tries to resolve this contradiction by violence, centering on mass incarceration with its ancillaries of capital punishment and police killings. When there is no way out of a contradiction, another solution must be found. For Jimmy and Grace Lee Boggs, writing back in 1976, a revolutionary period is one in which the only exit is a revolution. The abolition image today asks, is there no way out but revolution now? And I juxtapose uh, the transformed Wedgwood medallion to the sculpture by Thomas Ball in which uh, newly emancipated uh, enslaved peoples were forced pretty much to contribute to the creation of this sculpture uh, by Thomas Ball. It's a, the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, DC. And the profile of George Washington um, legitimates the presidency of Abraham Lincoln, who makes that gesture of beneficence over the half naked African who kneels at his feet. And so the, the gesture that Colin Kaepernick makes, initially he sat through the playing of the national anthem, but realized that wasn't enough, that to kneel before the national anthem um, was somehow more powerful. And in the absence of a liberator, I think Nick Mirzoff is right. It, it is more powerful. Part two, the function of black death and black suffering. Calvin Warren, in an essay titled Black Nihilism and the Politics of Hope, uh, written for the New Centennial Review in spring of 2015, writes the following. The American dream then is realized through black suffering. It is the humiliated, incarcerated, mutilated, and terrorized black body that serves as the vestibule for the democracy that is to come. In fact, it almost becomes impossible to think the political without black suffering. According to this logic, corporeal fracture engenders ontological coherence and a political arithmetic saturated with violence. Thus, nonviolence is a misnomer or somewhat of a ruse. Black sacrifice is necessary to achieve the American dream and its promise of coherence, progress, and equality. So I'd like to share with you something that 
haunts me uh, every time I teach the first part of my American art survey. survey. This is um, a headstone of a man named Caesar, uh, buried in Bristol County, Massachusetts, who was known as an honest and faithful servant of Lieutenant Josiah Maxey and Levi Maxey. He was also a member of the Baptist Church at North Attleboro, and is buried at Woodcock Cemetery, and he died in the year 1780. And this is what his headstone says. In memory of Caesar, here lies the best of slaves, now turning into dust. Caesar the Ethiopian craves a place among the just. His faithful soul has fled to realms of heavenly light, and by the blood that Jesus shed is changed from black to white. On January 15th, he quitted the stage in the 77th year of his age, 1780. Throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, African Americans were often called African or Ethiopian. Um, they were never really acknowledged as American. And in this praise, in the stone that praises the enslaved man Caesar, his reward, his heavenly reward, is to be changed from black to white. And so this idea of white supremacy um, as a door that can only be opened to Africans after death is not something um, unique to our time. It, it is part of white racial formation itself at its inception. The next few slides that I'd like to take us through um, have to do with identificatory, ugh, I always have problems with this word, although I love to write it, identificatory forms of both whiteness and witness, the faces in the crowd, the there uh, and the not there within those identificatory forms. Within the realm of black suffering and death, lynching photographs have a very particular role to play. Lynchings are a form of community formation, of community building and maintenance. The performance is on the ground. And if you look at the roles of the attendees and those who sent postcard, postcards of the events through the US mail, their names read like a ship's manifest of immigrants before they Americanized their names. The faces look out at us and they ask, where are you within this spectacle? In 2016, I taught a seminar um, titled Photographing Jim Crow. And we looked at the signs demarcating space, uh, you know, colored fountains, white fountains, no Negroes allowed, Negroes in the back. Uh, we also looked at lynching photographs. And we looked, one of the things I had us consider were the three iterations of lynching photography, where they belong in the spectrum uh, of, of, their appearance throughout history from the time of their making to today. And uh, we looked at them as, um, as that kind of community building, community formation phenomena. We looked at um, Ida B. Wells's A Red Record in which she challenges the existence of those photographs and notes that the crime is not with uh, the people who are tortured and mutilated, but the crime is with the people, those faces in the crowd. And then there are books uh, based on exhibitions like uh, the one before you, Without Sanctuary, 
lynching photography in America. And this one I pulled from the internet, the, um, the opening page of the book, and you see the dedication um, that someone wrote in the book to commemorate having attended this event. But there are three iterations of lynching photography that we look at and think about. Uh, its initial uh, taking uh, as a souvenir, an integral part of ritualized murder, where people took bits of clothing and skin and body parts, but also the photograph. They purchased photographs of the events. Today's versions are the photographs and films taken by bystanders or taken from police body cams of the ritualized murder of black and brown people. Lynching uh, photographs also existed as indictments used by groups like the NAACP to, um, to challenge the idea that uh, people were tortured and lynched for crimes that they had committed, that they moved the site of the crime down to the hungry public, right, in which the crime is not the victims, but the perpetrators. And in this way, challenges Black suffering and Black death um, and, and reveals the role that it plays in cementing American democracy. And then they exist as memorials, memorials for the dead, in which empathy as a social emotion assumes that all spectators view them with the same sorrow and regret, even as ease, empathy as social emotion, papers over the titillation such images inspire in some viewers. The spectacles of such deaths distract from systemic racism and pushes us further toward revolution. And this is uh, Walter Gadsden being attacked by K-9 units in Birmingham, Alabama, May 3rd, 1963, photo by Bill Hudson. And in Martin Berger's Seeing Through Race, a reinterpretation of civil rights photography, he argues that the ubiquity of such photographs may have limited the extent of reform from the start to the degree that narratives illustrating white power over blacks helped make the images non-threatening to whites. The photographs impeded efforts to enact or even imagine reforms that threatened white racial power. And Berger's point is a good one because one of the things he notes is that these images really do become so ubiquitous that we have a hard time seeing them anymore. Once he pointed out that the man being, the, the young black man being attacked, Walter Gadsden, actually has a knee in the neck, uh, in the, in the uh, chest of the dog that's attempting to bite him. Only when Berger points that out do we begin to see that these, these fantasies of, you know, these perfect victims, these perfect nonviolent victims of white supremacy, uh, they actually did resist. They actually did fight back. And, um, you know, now we're able to see that knee and never unsee it. But he makes another import, important point about telling history through the lens of empathy. He says, ironically, the violent whites who appeared in news accounts of Birmingham were ultimately cast as agents of progressive social change, despite their obvious desire to preserve the racial status quo. In contrast to much 19th and early 20th century imagery, wherein whites were the agents of social change they supported, the photographs and articles chronicling Birmingham consistently depicted Southern whites as forceful actors who inadvertently promoted changes they were determined to prevent. This view typified Northern whites' response to the civil rights struggle in the South. 
And I'd ask you to recall the countless newspaper articles on the heels of Trump's 2016 victory that called for the extension of empathy to his supporters. On September 6, 2018, off-duty Dallas Police Department patrol officer Amber Geiger entered the Dallas, Texas apartment of 26-year-old accountant Botham John and fatally shot him. Geiger said that she had entered the apartment believing it was her own and that she shot John believing he was a burglar. Geiger was not arrested for several days and then was initially charged with manslaughter, creating mistrust in the process and outrage over the killing of an unarmed African citizen. It resulted in protests and accusations of racial bias, and she was later charged with murder. On October 1st, 2019, Geiger was found guilty of murder. The next day, she was sentenced to a 10-year, uh, to sentence to 10 years in prison. On October 2nd, she was sent to, sentenced to 10 years in prison after the jury deliberated for an hour. During the sentencing hearing, Sean's mother, Allison, provided emotional testimony and some of Geiger's text messages and social media posts that were racist and offensive. Um, John's younger brother, Brant, forgave and hugged Geiger during her sentencing. John's father, Bertram, also stated that he forgave Geiger, but had wanted a stiffer sentence. Trial judge Tammy Kemp, there seen on the right, who is also African-American, drew controversy when she embraced Geiger and handed her a Bible with the Freedom for, From Religion Foundation, criticizing her for alleged proselytizing. And uh, after the trial, this photograph made the Dallas Morning News of Brant John hugging uh, Amber Geiger after her sentencing. And as the subheading says, um, our, our, our restorative justice may actually be more helpful for both the victim and the offender than traditional punishment. How Brent Jean turned Amber Geiger's trial into an example of restorative justice. And I would remind you of the words that Lori Marish uh, wrote and that I cited earlier uh, in the talk. Critics of sentimental literature have often pointed out that sympathy conventionally operates across a status divide. Typical objects of sympathy in these narratives are children, slaves, the poor, the disabled, and in sentimental narratives, it is the sympathy of the empowered for the disempowered, the strong for the weak, the fully human for the dehumanized that is enlisted as socially and ethically salient. The weak and sentimental texts have ethical primacy through their intimate knowledge of suffering, a sign of Christ-like authenticity, but they have nothing politically useful to learn from the strong. Becoming civilized in these texts entails a willing renunciation of power over others cast in bodily terms and marks the sublimation of aggression into sympathetic desire. And here his act of empathy is one of the ways in which systemic racism itself gets to be dismissed and ignored uh, in favor of the spectacle of empathy and empathetic exchange. Part three, am I not? Brett Kavanaugh and Ashley Estes Kavanaugh are shown here being interviewed by Martha McCallum from Fox News on September 24th, 2018. During this interview, Kavanaugh confesses, I was a virgin through high school and for many years after. And it's important in these stills that were part of um, the interview to note the gazes of the women, how they look at him. Uh, McCallum armored against him. We don't see her face. We can't detect any signs of 
empathy or sympathy. All we see are her notes highlighted. She is a professional. Um, in the meantime, his wife was largely silent during the interview and she looks at him with empathy, with sadness. Right? She reinforces um, his emotional um, kind of outrage over the accusations of sexual uh, uh, assault. Trump thought Kavanaugh looked weak. As a result, Kavanaugh went to the White House where he underwent hours of preparation for the new hearing based on Dr. Ford's charges. And here they are being sworn in on their respective days. Uh, Brett Kavanaugh was sworn in September 4th, 2018. Dr. Christine Blasey Ford was uh, sworn in September 27th, 2018. Senate Republicans had learned from the Clarence Thomas, Anita Hill hearings, uh, and their, their aggressive questioning of her. And here hired uh, Rachel Mitchell to question Kavanaugh and, For and Ford in place of themselves. They sat silent while Mitchell questioned Ford. And in terms of the range of emotions, the uh, ability to empathetically align with either Kavanaugh or Ford, um, that was pretty much it that you see on the face of Dr. Ford. Kavanaugh, on the other hand, was allowed a complete range of emotion from rage to outrage to tears um, while the, the focus is on the women in his family in the front row and their looks of uh, empathetic disgust and rage and anger. And so by now, the hearing had become the staging of a battle over empathy who would collect all of the empathy cards. And I followed it on Twitter as well. And I pulled a couple of tweets. I don't know too many of us who could survive the crying while talking about how much you love beer portion of the interview and still get the job. And Trent Larson, me fighting back tears. I just, I just love beer interviewer, sir. This is a job interview to be a children's school bus driver. And as I said, he was allowed the full range of emotion. She was pretty much limited to this. It was a horrifying spectacle. Uh, and here's Senator Lindsey Graham weighing in uh, about the persecution of Brett Kavanaugh. And it's a masterclass in who is allowed to be angry. A woman is, an, is not allowed to wear this face. She is called hysterical. A black man is not allowed to wear this face. He is called dangerous. This is what privilege looks like. As I said, they had learned from the Thomas Hill hearings. On October 11, 1991, Anita Hill gave her testimony before the U.S. Senate. <coughs> and Clarence Thomas, with his wife, Jenny, shown there behind him, up until that time had been very careful not to mention the word race or racism uh, both Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill had worked together under uh, uh, President Ronald Reagan. They're both Republican, both conservative. Uh, but according to Hill, Clarence Thomas aggressively sexually harassed her, uh, verbally sexually harassed her. And as I said, up until uh, 
the time that she appeared, Thomas had been very careful not to mention race or racism. He talked about growing up as a poor child in the South, how uh, the greatness of the United States gave him a series of opportunities, never mentioning race or racism until Anita Hill took the stand. And then he fires back in anger and uses the term a high-tech lynching, that he was being subjected to a high-tech lynching. And this is from Claudia Brodsky LaCour, uh, an essay titled Doing Things with Words. And she says, for Anita Hill's words were silenced, not by any conflicting testimony, nor certainly by anything that could be passed off as evidence, but by a word, the very word that unspoken had previously safeguarded Clarence Thomas from rigorous interrogation. It was in response to Anita Hill's testimony that Thomas said the word racism. And in proclaiming himself a victim of racism, an apparently enraged Thomas disarmed his interrog interrogators. From the Senate hearing room, to the press room, to the living room, the word racism cut off a mental channel of communication. Thomas's utterance of the word racism introduced into the proceedings following the testimony of a black woman was not only not conventional in context, it depended directly for its active rhetorical effect on the absence of any literal or identifiable object to which it could refer. It was a verbal act without a referent. But it hit its target. It hit the members of the Senate. And immediately, any kind of uh, questions about Thomas's behavior, uh, sexual behavior, were terminated. And here are juxtaposing views of the senators who uh, refused to question Dr. Ford and those senators uh, who did question Anita Hill directly. And there they are juxtaposed. And um, not only did, uh, I think, not only did the US senators learn something from what had happened in 1991, Anita Hill did not escape negative comparisons to Dr. Ford. Jamila Lemuse wrote on Twitter, every day I'm stunned that black women haven't burned this godforsaken country down yet. And she wrote this tweet in reaction to Johnny Mathis, who um, citing a CNN pundit uh, who noted that Blasey Ford's testimony is more resonant because unlike Anita Hill, who projected strength and poise, Blasey Ford projected vulnerability. And so you see the scaling and the hierarchies uh, within gender of who gets to be not believed, but felt, right? There was something off-putting about Hill's strength and poise, but something um, that made Ford more empathetically available because of her projected vulnerability. This saved neither woman, however. Both Clarence Thomas and Brett Kavanaugh were confirmed. And this is how it happens. This is how empathy gets diverted. Uh, from its initial um, subject. Jeff, here's Jeff Flake, Senator Jeff Flake, and a woman named Anna Maria Archila, who confronted Flake in an elevator. He's on his way back up to the Senate, uh, Senator's private quarters. She confronts him and she tells them about him, about her experience. And her parents up until that day, her own parents hadn't even known that she had been raped. When Lindsay, when she confronted Lindsey Graham, if you look at the third tweet, 
He said, as he headed into an elevator, I'm sorry, tell the cops. And so the diversion of empathy, it's, it's uh, re-channeling uh, to its intended, its real object, is almost complete. And there's Jeff Flake. Uh, there's so many stills of him appearing uh, tormented and moved, not just by Dr. Ford's testimony, but also by Brett Kavanaugh's testimony. And here are Senators Jeff Flake, a Republican from Arizona, and Chris Coons, Democrat from Delaware, who, sh who took the podium together. Uh, the real hero then is the friendship between men. Empathy is shared between them at the expense of Dr. Ford. And this was their joint interview on 60 Minutes on Sunday, September 30th, 2018. When I heard him, I heard someone I hope I would sound like if I had been unjustly accused. And to see his family behind him, that is what I heard. To see his family behind him is what I heard. And so the redeployment of empathy, not towards Dr. Ford and her experiences, but towards Brett Kavanaugh, what I call empathy for the devil, with apologies to the Rolling Stones, the rediversion of empathy here is complete, as you can go home again. The, the, the feelings among men, between men, is here cemented at the expense of the woman whose testimony left her as a 15-year-old in that room. The Tuesday after the hearing, I looked into my students' faces and I told them, we have failed you. I stopped any lesson plan for that day and I just took them through a lot more slides than I showed you today, but I took them through uh, the Kavanaugh hearing so that they could understand how empathy as a social emotion functions to actually stymie justice, to stop justice in its tracks. And here's uh, CNN Politics, October 6. U.S. Supreme Court, Kavanaugh is confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court on a 50 to 48 vote Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia was the sole Democrat who voted in favor of Kavanaugh, while Alaska Senator Lisa Murkowski was the only Republican to oppose his nomination. However, Murkowski withdrew her vote so that her colleague, Senator Steve Daines, could attend his daughter's wedding, which kept the two-vote margin. And thanks to the spectacle of empathy that the hearing became, two questions remain unanswered. What deal did Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy make with Trump and McConnell to step aside in order to make room for Kavanaugh? Most importantly, who paid off Kavanaugh's $92,000 in country club fees and who paid his personal credit card debt in excess of $200,000 as reported in 2016? Part four, at ease, the true power of victims. So I'd like to run through, as I said, it was very hard narrowing down material for this talk. Uh, and so I just, I chose um, a political ad that has been running lately. And it begins with, um, Kamala Harris's face emerging from all of these red faces. It's an ad uh, aired by the Trump Organization, September 5th, 2020, titled Meet Joe Biden's 
supporters. And she begins by saying that Black Lives Matter is a movement that won't be stopped. And then the ad uh, flows from there, showing Black victims of Black, life, uh, black, life, uh, black Lives Matter, uh, the destruction of property, which is what these videos tend to focus on, as do um, political statements about the movement. And so human property, uh, what, what was formerly human prop property, not, are not only the adversaries of property, but they are antithetical to property. The destruction of Black life signifies the preservation of property. It's why Kyle Rittenhouse is celebrated as a hero He's the 17 year old who drove from Illinois to Wisconsin and shot uh, three Black Lives Matter protesters. And why certain kinds of performative whiteness, that which identifies with Black Lives Matter, are punishable by death. No one escapes uh, in, this, in this era in which we have become antithetical to property, not just adversaries of property, but antithetical to property. Uh, it shows the, the burning of property and of course, um, firefighters looking over the destruction of property, more fire, uh, two white people trying to soothe one another in the face of this destruction and of course, one of Trump's favorite targets, Representative Elon Omar, uh, here saying we must defund the police. And then you see a series of images of Congress people kneeling. And here, um, Chuck Schumer, uh, Nancy Pelosi, and others wearing kente cloth uh, kneel in honor of John Lewis. And here Joe Biden is shown kneeling, taking a knee. And then this sign, no war, but class war. This is one commercial. Uh, and the Trump campaign actually splices and intersplices these images across ads. This is uh, one ad that I'm showing you. Racism ameliorates class conflict. It's one of the th first things you learn when you study, a, for example, 1676, Bacon's Rebellion, um, that as a nation, um, racism is what allows us to pretend to be relatively classless. The breakdown of racism, the thousands of white people who march on behalf of Black Lives Matter, signifies a class war in lieu of a race war. And therefore, no one is safe. And I think uh, about Heather Heyer, I think even about those three young men in Mississippi who were murdered in the 1960s. I think about the two protesters uh, in um, Minnesota who were killed. And then there's this scene, this image, Black Lives Matter, on fire. Police cars on fire, police being attacked. And then there's this image, another image of Joe Biden here kneeling before black men. And at the very end of the video, that young black man brings his hand up and gives the peace sign hand on his genitals, um, left hand on his genitals, right hand raises, and it's, it's that beneficent, menacing gesture, right? And then this, stop Joe Biden and his rioters, and then where you can text to vote. And I'd, what I'd like to, for us to consider is what this means in the context of the Wedgwood Medallion Colin Kaepernick kneel, kneeling, what it means for Joe Biden to kneel 
before Black Lives Matter. And in this case, to kneel before Black people in a Black church. It is a reversal and it is a betrayal in which the victim accepts the power to hold dominion over white men. When black suffering and death refuse to offer forgiveness, the betrayal of empathy on the part of the weak. It is the ultimate consequence of white absolution where white men and therefore white women are on their knees instead of black men and black women. And I posted this on September 25th and it's in form of uh, a conclusion. I don't care what randomly polled people think of Black Lives Matter, but its so-called drop in support tells me that we do not have the attention span for justice. And I'm ready to take questions. I'll, I'll just come in for one second here. Thank you so much. This talk is amazing and has given us so much to think about. So thank you so much. Also, yes, you did a lot of work. People don't know unless they craft talks like this, how much work went into producing a talk like this when there is so much material to be um, drawn from. Um, so there's a curation, a curation of thought here as well. Um, okay, um, and I can see um, that there are some questions. Um, there's one question so far that I'm seeing in this. What I'll give people a minute to um, put to enter their questions in the Q&A. And while they're doing that, um, perhaps I'll, I'll pose a question to just give us some time here. So um, as you're speaking, um, you know, there's so much controversy around statues, monuments, memorials, as we both know. And those debates unfold in various ways. So what I'm thinking about is how um, responses of, of empathy are sometimes elicited by these visual representations, whether you identify with them or reject them, right? But this capacity for a kind of um, representation to function in this way. And I'm just, that made me think in turn about the ways in which and the relations between this kind of empathetic or empathic appropriation of human subjects functions, right, in our public sphere versus the ways in which these symbolic empathic appropriations function around objects. So whether there's just something else to be said about the relations between subjects and objects, how similar, how different might they be? Well, one of the uh, points that scholars like Lori Marish may, uh, make is that we identify ourselves through objects, that um, we assemble ourselves through the things that we can afford or cannot afford. And so the problem with statues is that we confuse them for history. Statues are not history. They have the history, but they are not history. And so if you and I'm glad that the Mellon is funding the huge project to uh, kind of re-envision statues, the function and what kinds. But for the most part, I see them as hegemonic statements. You know, after, after the activist has been jailed for 30 years out of his, his 90 years, his best activist years have been um, controlled by the state, well, the the now a beneficent state will put up a statue in that person's honor. Uh, or you'll have a, a, an immigrant group who wants to assert their belonging in this country. And so they'll put up a statue, for example, of Columbus. Uh, and it's, it speaks to um, the desire to belong, certainly, especially um, for example, uh, the, the example of Columbus is a good one, I think, in that the Italians who immigrated here were usually from Southern Italy. And they already had issues of belonging within Italy itself. And then to come here, often after Irish immigrants had established themselves, right, they found an environment un, uh, very unwelcoming for them as Italians, but also within their Catholic communities. And uh, the scholar John Gerda, who's done a lot of work 
on 19th century Protestantism. Uh, you know, he says that religion was, the, was one of the main impediments in the 19th century to white racial formation. And often when Italians immigrated to this country, they were permitted into Irish Catholic churches, but they had to hold their ceremonies in the basement. And so these statues are, they have histories uh, that tell us about belonging and about the desire to belong and how we desire to situate ourselves in these contexts. Thank you. I can see now that the questions are coming in. So Bradley, I'm going to turn this to you and let the questions come to Professor Buick. Great, thank you, Dr. Brennan. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Buick for this amazing talk, sort of tracing us through the history of the use of empathy, of empathy uh, throughout the US, even uh, touching on issues relevant to us in the past few weeks. Uh, we have a few questions here. First one is, uh, thank you so much for incredibly powerful, timely, and important reflections. I'm curious if you could say more about opening space for rational compassion in contrast empathy, which you mentioned at the beginning of your talk. Mm -hmm. Uh, Paul Bloom, who teaches at Yale, uh, wrote a really ex accessible book on empathy. Uh, it's called Against Empathy. And uh, I think that it's, it's a more accessible text than Emmanuel Levinas, for example. But um, what Bloom argues is that empathy has allowed for, it has accommodated crimes against humanity as you decide who deserves your empathy. Uh, and so you withdraw and you extend depending on those with whom you can identify. Um, and, but what Levinas, what Levinas argues is that we should acknowledge our obligation to the other, not based on any fantasies of absorption or uh, assimilation of the other into the self, but based on the acknowledged difference of the other, that you face the other rather than absorb them, and that your obligation to act on their behalf is because they are different, because they are um, not you. And so rational compassion is Paul Bloom's way of uh, rethinking uh, empathetic engagement because so often it betrays us and it makes us act on our worst instincts. All the while that we feel we're doing good. Thank you. Um, so next question we have is, what ways do statuary and monuments, figurative or abstract, have the potential to redress history, if at all? I was a museum educator for four years and statues um, and monuments and memorials, they require mediation and they will change over time given the needs of the current situation, how we teach them, what lessons we draw for them are, are largely dependent on what we need today. And so um, I'm not opposed to uh, a museum of rejected statues. Like I said, I was a museum educator for four years. Those could be very interesting spaces. Uh, but like I said, the, these things change and public space itself should change. <clears throat> I, I, call, I call us culture hoarders. We hoard culture. And you know, once it's in place, we're afraid uh, to get rid of it, we're afraid for it to change. And as Octavia Butler wrote, change is the only constant. Okay, um, so this is a slightly longer one. It is helpful to see how engendering conceptualization of black people as victims makes the whole issue of injustice less threatening for white people to consider having to respond to. Do you think overall there has been more of a genuine humanizing and increased agency portrayed in the images of people of color in recent years, as opposed to attempting to portray simply victimization? Um, it's hard for me to see that 
because it's hard. A man named, a black man named Jonathan Price was killed yesterday, a black man killed by the Dallas police. Um, I assume that the officer's body cam uh, will be released at some point, but I, I don't, I don't, um, see, that's the thing about the word humanization. I think that we do these things to one another because we know that the other is human. Uh, I think that the easy availability of these images actually function in lieu of lynching photographs that the images of officers kneeling on George Floyd's neck, um, what happened to Breonna Taylor, the lavish descriptions in the trial, the transcripts from the trial, they function like lynchings, that they are part of continuing, not of dehumanization, but uh, like Calvin Warren, I reject the idea of dehumanization. Instead, they are a glorification of what humans do to other humans. And, and so I just, I just think that uh, these images fill the vacuum of lynching photographs and that they're part of the same process that celebrate and ritualize Black death and suffering. There is a whole section I took out uh, on um, the tear gas being shot over into Mexico uh, on the Mexican border with the photographs of children in diapers screaming and crying and being led away by their parents. And the question becomes, why do we focus so much on the children in these camps and the idea of, being, of children being torn away from their parents, and it's because children evoke more empathy than adults do. And so we, we talk all the time about these children, but what about the adults as well? And if you notice, our attention span for, for that, the, these camps, was not very long. There was a period where the Trump administration was on the hot seat, but that didn't last long. Did that answer the question, Bradley? <laughs> Sorry. Um, another person actually did ask about other examples of spectacles that produce community formation and they use lynching as an example. And so it sounds like uh, you're referring to different kinds of police killings and such as playing that role. Yes. Yeah. And the, the spectacles uh, at the border, absolutely. And at Standing Rock. So we, we have all kinds of examples that we can work with and examine these. Uh, another question was, starts with, thank you so much, Dr. Buick, for your car carefully crafted words, thoughts, and extensive work. Can you revisit and expand upon the impact of Biden's kneeling gesture? Just so we can impact that a bit more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, within the, the history of the the Wedgwood medallion, the image of the supplicant uh, black figure, the use of, of Biden's image kneeling like that figure, it subverts the way in which uh, the subservient black figure, the, the pleading black figure it, it subverts it and perverts it to, to depict a white male in that pose. And, and that's why I, I kind of took us through the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, because after that Fox News interview and Kavanaugh got called to the White House because Trump 
you know, who, he, who himself is an accused sexual predator, told Kavanaugh, you look weak. Right? Trump's campaign against Biden is all about making him not just look weak, but look subservient to Black Lives Matter, to look subservient to Blackness itself. And so the repeated images of him kneeling, kneeling in a, in a black place of worship, kneeling before black people, kneeling like Colin Kaepernick, uh, it, it attempts to attack Biden's, not just his masculinity, but the privilege he enjoys and that he is voluntarily ceding to blackness and, and the kind of images of blackness where underlying uh, all of these images of victimization is the hatred that we feel as human beings towards victims. The idea that victims have some kind of power over us, that they make us feel obligated to uh, extend to them privileges and rights that belong to us and that in that cannot be shared so as 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 human beings we tend to resent victims and we suspect that they have power and so the the inversion uh of biden who is now the supplicant and and you know over whom stands black males it's a complete reversal of those abolitionist images where the grantor of freedom is a white male and sometimes a white female. Very interesting. Um, so another question. Thank you so much for putting together this amazing talk. A lot of these questions start with compliments and rightly so, I think. I'm very interested in what you said about how empathy can actually stop justice from happening. Uh, may I ask you to expand a bit on this, perhaps even using examples from within, within the history of art? Thank you. Um, within the history of art, um, that, that's a harder question given uh, what we've done to art that we tend to separate, separate out a use function from an aesthetic function as if aesthetics isn't useful. And that's why I tend to, in my seminars and classes, start with art and then go into popular culture because that's where the traditional function of art often escapes to. And it's why I think the, uh, the Kavanaugh-Ford hearings are so important because you got to see in real time how empathy gets pulled away from Ford and her story and, and you know, her telling of what happened to her when she was 15, how empathy gets pulled away from her through the emotions and, and the kind of the range of emotions allowed uh, white men in this case, and how through the, the empathy of the senators, you know, the, the other as the self and the other as the self same, their empathy naturally goes to Brett Kavanaugh because he is the one that they can imagine themselves being. If, if as, as Jeff Flake said, He's, this is how I would respond if I had been unjustly accused of what he'd been accused of. And so empathy, even though uh, Senator Coons voted against Kavanaugh, it's still their joint spectacle on 60 Minutes, their joint spectacle at the podium that takes empathy and turns it away from Dr. Ford who now, you know, who had subsequent to that had to leave her home, had to move because she was being threatened, right? Takes empathy, turns it away from Ford and turns it on to Kavanaugh. 
Thank you. Uh, we have a question about um, how to deal with representations that are symbols of resistance to white hegemony on the one hand, but implicitly racist on the other. For example, the desire of some in New Mexico to be identified as Spanish or Spanish American, distinct from mainstream Anglo society, but which at the same time denies any connection to native or Mexican background. Um, yeah, and you know, this is, this is where statues and public space and violence, this is where it all collides, right? In, in um, New Mexico, um, there was uh, someone who, a, a young man who went to defend his Hispanic heritage uh, because a statue of Oñate was about to be moved, about to be torn down. And he shot a student um, who's from the University of New Mexico uh, and the student was white. Right? And so because, because we aren't taught that statues have a history and are not a history, and because we are so bound up in these ideas about property and about um, objects that love us back, you know, this is part of the enlightenment um, that Lori Marish talks about, how we learn to care and love objects. And here an object is loved at the expense of almost of someone's life where this young man was shot because someone was defending a statue. It's why I started the talk with the case of uh, uh, Louise Lucas, who was charged with injuring a Confederate statue. It, it, it's not, it's physically impossible, but emotionally, empathetically, um, given this political climate, it is quite possible Thank you. Uh, we have a question about museums and the place they play in empathy. Since teaching empathy is very often very central to contemporary museum education, uh, could you discuss how that became a central part of uh, the function museums and what are some of the problems with that? Um, that is a, that's a very good question. I left the museum world deliberately and in part it was because behind the scenes they were corporatizing but on the floor they were they tended to be filled with stories of empathy that often hid the history the problematic histories of the artists housed in those spaces uh, museums have secrets. They, um, it's, it's often, well, the, the best, especially in American museum, the, the best way to kind of understand what is happening in a museum in an American context is to walk around it. What gets privileged uh, in its, in its more um, kind of sanctified spaces. The, the museum I'm most familiar with is the Art Institute of Chicago. And when I was growing up, photography was in the basement. African art was in a hallway. Um, the African art there hadn't been collected until the late 19th century. The Field Museum uh, had a, a much larger collection of African ritual objects. And so the ways in which education was asked to compensate for that was to create these tours <coughs> led by docents and the, the fictions of continuity were then often played out so that you go from uh, the African section works of 
the works of which were often contemporary to the African American section, the early African American section. <clears throat> you go from there to African American art with no mention of enslavement, for example, because um, because that might be uncomfortable for school children, or they may not have spoken about it in uh, in their classes or in their schools. And so the ways in which museums organize themselves, the ways in which they work very hard to stay the same, for example, hiring temporary curators who are people of color to fill uh, temporary diversity needs while keeping the status quo. Museums are very complicated spaces. They, they use empathy to often divert real discussions about systemic problems. They are a lot like the outside, the larger culture and the things that they obfuscate and the things they emphasize feeling over uh, actual solving of systemic problems within the museum itself. And so they, they work a lot like the larger society. And it's why I left, because <laughs> I'd rather talk to students than curators. <laughs> and on that note, I think we have time for two more questions. Okay, great. Um, so talking, talking about another one of the examples you used, uh, how, how do you expect the representations of Colin Kaepernick to change between now and then five years and 50 years from now? So looking at some of those photographs of civil rights protesters and how we talk about them today versus how media talked about them back then, how would you expect Colin Kaepernick's image to change? Things happen a lot faster now. And the NFL is already admitting that he was right, even though they won't let him back in. And part of me is kind of glad uh, because I think he's more important as an activist than a brain damaged football player. Um, I think that the work is already being done by scholars like Nicholas Mirzoff and Martin Berger uh, who are combing through this material and scholars in uh, England like uh, Marcus Wood who wrote Blind Memory and uh, The Horrible Gift of Freedom. And so we're a lot faster uh, in considering the impact of these images. And so um, I, I think the work is being done. And as I said, the NFL has already admitted that um, Kaepernick was right, um, but now we're in campaign season. And so, you know, in this country now, every, one day feels like a hundred years. So the, the ways in which the Trump campaign is retooling the Kaepernick gesture, it's, it's you know, reversals, two steps forward, three steps back. Yeah, and it's, as a historian, it's hard for me to see into the future. <laughs> and sometimes I like it that way. Because I really did look into the faces of my students and tell them we have failed you. And part of the anxiety of living in such chaotic times as now is that it's, we want someone to give us an idea of what's coming next, and it can be really hard to tell at this point. I have no idea. So for our last question, um, is starts with, my fear is that we will use 2020 as a metric for ease and progress, thus applauding nominal change even after the consequences of the status quo have wrecked us. What do you think will be our Wedgwood medallion? What could be like our uh, symbolic, um, thing to change. Is there any equivalent for us at the moment? Well, okay, let me backtrack a little and say that I do find hope in the young people. Uh, I, hate, I hate that we have to rely on them 
to fix our mistakes. But the transracial um, activism that I see, and it's, you know, it's why I worship John Lewis, because he never, he never disavowed Black Lives Matter. He's always push ahead. I like what I'm seeing. He was never, oh, you aren't doing this right. You aren't doing it the way I would have done it. You aren't doing it the way it should be done. And so I, I find hope in, in today's youth. Um, in part, it's because we mess things up so horribly. They have no space to be comfortable. Their student loan debt is out of this world. I can't do what my grandfather was able to do on one construction worker's salary, which is to buy three houses and property in Michigan and Arkansas. I can't do that on one salary. Imagine what they will not be able to do. And so we've, we've primed the pump for change because everyone's back is against the wall right now. So that, that's, that's my vision, if you will, but it's through the eyes of my students and the shambles that we've left them in terms of the planet and relations on the planet. Let me just say thank you on that note and just agree wholeheartedly. This is one of the great privileges of being an educator, right? I mean, that we have them and they, our students become our teachers um, in so many ways. This was just amazing, um, just such uh, so much to think about and such a valuable contribution to our lecture series. I just thank you so much, so much for this talk. And I'd like to thank everyone who joined us and who was able to be present, who offered their time, their attention, their presence, and their questions. Yes. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And uh, again, do look at our website, our religion department website, for more upcoming lectures, Rockwell lectures, on the series. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.